<laughs> the president is ratcheting up his anti-impeachment rhetoric. First it was treason, then he repeated a claim that it would cause a civil war-like fracture. Now he's going here. What's taking place is not an impeachment, it's a coup. The notion that Democrats are trying to violently overthrow the president is nothing new in far-right media circles, but it has been uh, since been used by president's aides and congressional allies to describe the impeachment push. Make no mistake about this. This is nothing less than an attempted coup d'etat and end run around the ballot box. It's a, uh, this is an attempted coup by the uh, intelligence community. It's worth noting that a coup refers to the illegal and at times violent overthrow of a leader. Impeachment is the legal process for removing the president as laid out in our Constitution. So, uh, Willie, I, uh, you know, this is so tiresome. <laughs> it's, it's also extraordinarily reckless coming from a president. I mean, we have to at least give Bill Clinton that. He, it's something he did not, he never did talk about a coup being carried out against him. But, you know, uh, a lot of Democrats did. I, I said yesterday, all this old is new again. It was maddening when Democrats were running around during the Clinton impeachment talking about how it was a coup, it was a Republican coup, it was a partisan coup. You had, well, Jerry Nadler said it, you mm. know, Maxine Waters said it, uh, uh, John Conyers, head of the Judiciary Committee, or the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee said it. It, it. And as I said then, as a member of Congress, and I say now, no, it's actually not a coup. It is a constitutional process. Our founders, and you can go back and you look at the Federalist Papers, our founders looked very closely at what was required for removing a president. And it's a very difficult, hard, it's a very difficult thing to do. And all of those Republicans who are saying that it is a coup, I don't think any of them actually believe that even if this, the House impeaches a president, that the Senate's going to remove them. So again, more bluster, more lying, more misrepresenting, more twisting of the truth to protect that one man. A man whose poor, poor mind actually has scurrying around inside of it dreams of moats filled with mm. snakes and alligators yeah. and flesh piercing spikes on the top of imaginary walls. That's th this, this man who has no respect for constitutional norms, who orders businesses out of other countries, who orders our NATO allies to give him Greenland, who calls the Federal Reserve Chairman the enemy of the United States for trying to stop our saying critical things about tariffs. This is who all of these people are putting their reputations on the line for to defend. A lot of people waking up will think you made up That's some well of those put. details about the alligators and the None. snakes. Nope, those are quotes from the we'll president of the United States, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But as with Donald Trump, we're not surprised, but we ought to continue to be outraged when he says things like civil war, when he talks about a coup, when he accuses his political opponents of treason. Um, John Meacham, we have right now a government in the State Department with Mike Pompeo and justice with William Barr running around, literally running around the world in Barr's case, going to Italy and ha taking meetings to put up these walls around the president and to protect him and to chase his conspiracy theories. The government is now operating on the whims, the personal whims, the political whims of the president of the United States. It's no way to run a country. It's not, and you're right. We, we basically had a constitutionalization of narcissism. Uh, that, that is essentially what, what's happened here. Uh, on the history point, what's, what's important, I think, uh, to push back against the coup stuff, is there was a clear debate uh, in Philadelphia and in the ratification conventions in the 1780s about could you impeach a president for what uh, was called maladministration, just screwing things up. Uh, and they decided no. That, that that was for the voters. It was very specifically designed for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, there was an absolute sense that this was very serious. It should only be undertaken in the, in the event of the betrayal of the country, uh, putting yourself up for sale, 
and trying mm. to use the government, as you say, as a personal instrument of power mm. as opposed to having it in trust for the people. It, maybe this right. sounds too much like a civics lessons for, for this hour, but it, this is actually really important. The entire insight here, the entire experiment that so many people on the right and in the Trump world want is they, they believe in America. They, but it's the America in their heads. It's not necessarily the America that really existed and should exist. And that America is one where the rule of law is more important than the whim of any president. And as far as building moats and, and putting alligators and, and all of that, why is it we are building walls and moats at the border, but we can't put up a wall around our own sovereign elections? I think that's a question that should be asked. Well, it, it really is. And, and Mike Barnacle, um, that's what's so fascinating, this obsession, this continued obsession with building a wall, which the president, of course, hasn't been able to do because Republicans, when they were in power, knew and said it, the wall wouldn't actually stop people from coming over. There, there are much better means. You can move past second century China, third century, fourth century China, and actually move beyond physical barriers to stop people from coming into our country. And yet, here you have William Barr and Donald Trump running around the world, chasing ghosts, still obsessed on the 2016 election. When Donald Trump's own FBI director, Donald Trump's own director of national intelligence, Donald Trump's own CIA director, Donald Trump's own uh, Homeland Security secretary, they have all said over the past year, that the single greatest threat, the sing just seriously, let's just stop here for one second. I want everybody at home to think about this. Just focus on this. Donald Trump's entire intel community has told him, the very people that Donald Trump appointed to the intel community, to follow up on what John said, think about this, okay? The single greatest threat to America is not thermonuclear war. It is our democracy being infiltrated by Russia. And yet the President of the United States does nothing about it. The Attorney General does nothing about it. Moscow Mitch does nothing about it. And instead, they're chasing ghosts around the planet, trying to undermine those intel community leaders, those very intel community leaders that are warning of the coming Russian threat. Mike? Well, Joe, some might we, call it treason. I wouldn't. I would just say it's extraordinarily misguided and it undercuts America's national security every single day. Every single day. And most people go about their business in this country every single day, uh, paying less and less attention to all the noise coming from Washington, D.C. And yet, you had the Attorney General of the United States, Bill Barr, in Rome looking over the shoulders of John Durham, who was charged with executing an independent investigation of a portion of this madness. I know John Durham, and he is a skilled investigator. He's absolutely independent, but he's got the Attorney General now apparently looking over his shoulder. That's one count. The other count is Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. another constitutional cabinet officer, willfully ignoring thus far the attempts by Congress, the Judiciary Committee, to subpoena employees of the State Department for their views to be questioned uh, in depositions on what is going on. Apparently, Mike Pompeo never read Article 3 of the Nixon impeachments, which has to do with obstruction of justice as defined by refusal to comply mm -hmm. with Congress's subpoenas. And lastly, Richard, I don't know about you, but the continued talk, as Joe and Meeker have been mentioning this morning, of treason and coup. This is a big country. Trump has a truly rabid following. Many of them good and decent people. Some of them, given the nature of our country, deranged. And you just wonder and you worry about what might inevitably happen. Two reactions. One is the president and those, uh, Peter King and others, are describing impeachment as a coup. 
If there's a coup going on, it's not in the impeachment process. That is what the Constitution lays out. It is essentially what the president and some of those around him are doing by undermining the normal procedures of government, by not allowing Congress to play its legitimate constitutional role by attacking the deep state, by going after the independence of judges, the independence of the media, by not allowing people to testify. That is what is undermining the political system. In Latin America, interestingly enough, Mike, there's a phrase called autogolpe, self-coups. It's when governments fear people and the, insta the, uh, the normal assemblies and, and legislatures moving against them, and they essentially cut them off and they stop the normal political process. What we are seeing here in the United States is an attempt to stop the legitimate processes of government, to undermine the legitimate organs of government in order to protect the president. This is, this is dangerous, and what you're getting at is also, this is sowing the seeds of violence. If you delegitimize government, if you delegitimize what is normal, then you're creating a space for something else, and the something else is either extra constitutional political activity or even worse mm -hmm. in some ways, violence. And that is what we're beginning to see here. Well, and why don't we be specific? Of course, you could go back to the campaign where Donald Trump talked about paying money to people who would beat up other people, that he would pay their legal bills, uh, talking about how he really looked back and fondly remember the times that people used to get beaten up and carried out of stretchers and political rallies. He wished that it could happen again. You have Donald Trump, of course, talking about violence, bragging about a, a member of Congress who beat up uh, somebody in the press uh, and laughing about it uh, because the person in the press had the audacity to ask about health care. Then just this past week, and we could keep going, but, you know, Donald Trump continues to uh, use violent rhetoric. A year ago, of course, he was talking about how his people were tough people, and at some point they were going to explode and they could get violent uh, and, and, and world watch out. And then, of course, this week, the president talks about a civil war. He tweets that a civil war could occur if, if, if he were impeached. A civil war wouldn't occur, but he is trying to inspire some some very rabid people to shoot others. Uh, maybe that's where the Fifth Avenue shooting comes in. I don't know. But he talks about a civil war this week. He talks about uh, the treason, trying for treason, a congressman, a duly elected congressman, who yeah. is just investigating a phone call, which I think a lot of Americans might think was treasonous. Uh, and. So after that, uh, of course, he's talking about civil war, he's talking about treason, talking about the possible execution of, of Adam Schiff and a whistleblower. And, and so, Elise, you line all of that up, and, and here is a president that is, is trafficking in violent imagery, which, of course, will not lead to civil war, but will lead to the type of unmoored human beings out there who have directed pipe bombs at Donald Trump's opponents who have made up hit lists. And uh, the, the, the Coast Guard, I, th I think he's a lieutenant, who made up a hit list <clears throat> and, and a huge arms cache uh, that he was going to use against members of the media that criticized Donald Trump, as well as the Democrats who were running for president against Donald Trump. And yet this inflammatory rhetoric continues, and Republicans are silent. Joe, it, I guess it just hasn't gotten bad enough. I, you wonder what the real low point will actually be. But this is a president who rose to power through lies. It's a pre he's a president who holds on to his power through lies. He lives in a fantasy land where he cannot himself distinguish fact from fiction. And so you see the severe repercussions throughout his foreign policy, throughout his domestic policy, whether it's, you know, wanting a flat black paint for his, quote, wall, um, 
that would cost a million dollars more per uh, per mile than you know a normal paint, and he's you know in that la la land, or it's sending his personal lawyer Rudy Giuliani over to Ukraine to investigate uh, just smorgasbord of conspiracy theories all thrown together that Hillary's server actually is in Ukraine and that he's going to get to the bottom of that. You look at all the government resources that are being wasted that could be used to prevent actual crime and actual actual criminality in the United States and abroad. It could be used to prevent election fraud. It could be used for so many different things that are valid purposes for our national security. But instead, it's just more la-la land. And really, this summer marked even more of a decline in Donald Trump. And I think that's what we're seeing kind of yeah. the peak of right now. Joe, to your point, I don't think there's anyone around this table or anyone watching at home who thinks whether President Trump is impeached or if he's uh, not reelected, that he will go quietly. And so that's the context in which you hear this coup talk and you hear this civil war talk. Yeah. What will the president do, really, if he's not reelected, if he's impeached? I remember sitting here in this studio on Election Day 2016, and we had Don Jr. on the show, and we had to ask the question, will your father respect the results of this election if he, in fact, loses? And he said, yeah, yeah, of course he will. We didn't have to find out the answer to that because President Trump won, of course. But there are real concerns about what happens the day after if President Trump is impeached or if he loses his reelection bid, because this is a president unlike any other. George W. Bush won't talk about President Obama. President Obama has been relatively quiet about President Trump. Do you really think President Trump is going to go away and be quiet? No way. He won't go quietly into that dark night. No doubt about that. I do think that the institutions will hold. I, I still remain very optimistic about that, probably more optimistic than others, certainly more optimistic than my wife. <laughs> uh, but I, I do believe that that will happen. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.